the muscular and the skeletal system are also two systems that work together. You can't really talk about one without the other. And there's a third system that helps trigger the movement of muscles that we'll also talk about, and that's the, the neurological system. So we'll first talk about the skeletal system. The human skeleton is an endoskeleton because that's within our body. There's certain organisms that have an exoskeleton where the rigid support is also their protection and it's on the outside of their body, things like arthropods, things like crustaceans. But we have our rigid skeleton on the inside and we call that an endoskeleton. Ours consists of 206 bones. The axial skeleton forms the central axis of the body and includes the bones of the skull, the ossicles of the middle ear, and the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage, or your rib cage. The bones of the skull support the structures of the face, and they also protect the brain. Essentially, bones do two things. They either protect things, like the rib cage protects the insides of our torso, our skull protects our brain, or they serve as structure, as like rigid structure to give us support, and they give us a point that muscles can leverage off of in order to move our body one way or another. We also have auditory bones. The auditory ossicles of the middle ear, they transmit sound from the air as vibrations through the fluid-filled cochlea. Those vibrations are picked up by nerves and translated as sound, and that's how we can hear. The hyoid bone lies just below the mandible in front of the neck. It acts as a movable base for the tongue and it's connected to the muscles of the jaw, the larynx, and the tongue. The mandible forms a joint with the base of the skull and controls the opening of the mouth. The vertebral column is protective and it surrounds the spinal cord. It also supports the head and acts as an attachment point for ribs and muscles of the back and neck. The vertebral column consists of 26 bones, 24 vertebrae, the sacrum, and the coccyx. The thoracic cage, also known as the rib cage, is protective and consists of ribs, the sternum, the thoracic vertebrae, and costal cartilage. The thoracic cage encloses and protects the organs of the thoracic cavity, including the heart and the lungs. The appendicular skeleton is composed of bones of the upper and lower limbs. It also includes the pectoral or shoulder girdle, which attaches to the upper limbs to the body, and the pelvic girdle, which attaches to the lower limbs of the body. The pectoral girdle bones transfer force generated by muscles acting on the upper limb to the thorax. It contains the clavicles in the anterior and the scapula in the posterior. The upper limb contains bones of the arm, the forearm, and the hand. The humerus is the largest and the longest bone of the upper limb. It forms a joint with the shoulder and with the forearm of the elbow. The forearm extends from the elbow to the wrist and consists of two bones. The hand includes the bones of the wrist, the palm, and the bones of the fingers. The pelvic girdle attaches to the lower limbs of the axial skeleton. The pelvic girdle is mainly composed of two large hip bones. The hip bones join together in the anterior of the body at a joint called the pubic symphysis and with the bones of the sacrum at the posterior of the body. The lower limbs consist of the thigh, the leg, and the foot. The bones of the lower limbs are thicker and stronger than the bones of the upper limbs to support the entire weight of the body and the forces of locomotion. The femur, or the thigh bone, is the longest, heaviest, and strongest bone in the body. The femur and the pelvis form the hip joint. At its other end, the femur, along with the shin bone and kneecap, form the knee joint. Movement of our skeletal structure is made through the help of muscles. Muscles also facilitate bodily processes such as respiration and digestion. Our bodies contain mainly three kinds of muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Skeletal muscles are long and cylindrical and have multiple nuclei, and the small dark nuclei are pushed to the periphery of the cell. Smooth muscles are short and tapered at each end and have only one nucleus per cell. Cardiac muscles are also cylindrical but short. Skeletal muscle tissues form skeletal muscles, which attach the bones and sometimes to the skin and control locomotion and any other movement that can be consciously controlled. When viewed under a microscope, skeletal muscle tissue has a striped or striated appearance. Smooth muscle tissue occurs in the walls of hollow organs such as the intestines, stomach, 
urinary bladder, and around passages such as the respiratory tract and blood vessels. Smooth muscle has no striations and is not under voluntary control. Cardiac muscle is only found in the heart. The contractions of cardiac muscle tissue pump blood throughout the body and maintain blood pressure. Cardiac muscle tissue is striated, but cardiac muscle tissue cannot be consciously controlled. And it's called an involuntary muscle. Each skeletal muscle fiber is a muscle cell. Within each muscle fiber are myofibrils, which are long cylindrical structures that lie parallel to the muscle fiber. Myofibrils run the entire length of the muscle fiber. All muscle contractions are facilitated by the nervous system. While there is a great diversity among different vertebrate nervous systems, they all share one basic structure, a central nervous system that we call the CNS, which contains a brain and a spinal cord, and a PNS made of a peripheral sensory and motor nerve system. The nervous system is made up of neurons, which are specialized cells that can receive and transmit chemical or electrical signals, and glia, which are cells that provide support functions for the neurons. There's a great diversity in the type of neurons and glia that are present in different parts of the nervous system. Most neurons share the same cellular components, but neurons are also highly specialized, and different types of neurons have different sizes and shapes that relate to their functional roles. Neurons also contain unique structures for receiving and sending electrical signals that make communication between neurons possible. Dendrites are tree-like structures that extend away from the cell body to receive messages from other neurons at specialized junctions called synapses. The central nervous system, the CNS, is made up of the brain and the spinal cord and is covered with three layers of protective coverings called meninges. The outermost layer is the dura mater. The middle layer is a web-like arachnoid mater, and the inner layer is the pia mater, which directly contacts and covers the brain and spinal cord. The space between the arachnoid and pia maters is filled with cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. The brain floats in CSF, which acts as a cushion and a shock absorber. The brain is part of the central nervous system that is contained in the cranial cavity of the skull. It includes the cerebral cortex, the limbic system, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the cerebellum, the brainstem, and retinas. The outermost part of the brain is a thick piece of nervous system tissue called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex, limbic system, and the basal ganglia make up the two cerebral hemispheres. The frontal lobe is located at the front of the brain over the eyes. This lobe contains the olfactory bulb, which processes smells. The frontal lobe also contains the motor cortex, which is important for planning and implementing movement. Areas within the motor cortex map to different muscle groups. Neurons in the frontal lobe also control cognitive functions like maintaining attention, speech, and decision making. Studies of humans who have damaged their frontal lobes show that parts of this area are involved in personality, socializing, and assessing risk. The parietal lobe is located at the top of the brain. Neurons in the parietal lobe are involved in speech and also reading. Two of the parietal lobe's main functions are processing somatosensation, touch like pressure, pain, heat, and cold, and processing proprioception, the sense of how parts of the body are oriented in space. The occipital lobe is located at the back of the brain and is primarily involved in vision, seeing, recognizing, and identifying the visual world. The temporal lobe is located at the base of the brain and is primarily involved in processing and interpreting sounds. It also contains the hippocampus, a structure that processes memory formation. The cerebellum sits at the base of the brain on top of the brainstem. The cerebellum controls balance and aids in coordinating movements and learning new motor tasks. The cerebellum of birds is large compared to other vertebrates because of the coordination required to fly. The peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, is the connection between the central nervous system and the rest of the body. The PNS can be broken down into the autonomic nervous system, which controls bodily functions without conscious control, and the sensory somatic nervous system, which transmits sensory information from the skin, muscle, and sensory organs to the central nervous system, and sends motor commands from the central nervous system to the muscles. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the immediate response an animal makes when it encounters a dangerous situation. One way to remember this is to think of the fight-or-flight response a person feels when encountering a snake. 
Examples of functions controlled by the sympathetic nervous system include an ancestral heart rate and inhibited digestion. The parasympathetic nervous system allows an animal to rest and digest. Parasympathetic preganglionic neurons have cell bodies located in the brainstem and in the sacral spinal cord. The parasympathetic nervous system resets organ functions after the sympathetic nervous system is activated, included slowing of the heart rate, lowering blood pressure, and the stimulation of digestion.